Today's Army report takes his cameras to Fort Hood, Texas, and to Washington, D.C. for a first-hand look at some interesting Army activities. During the Second World War, Armour, employed on a scale unprecedented in military history, played a critical role in bringing victory to the Allied forces. U.S. Armour units distinguished themselves in many historic battles. At Fort Hood, Texas, Two famous U.S. Army armored divisions activated during World War II celebrate their 28th anniversary. Fort Hood prepares for a big day as word of the joint anniversary spreads. Lieutenant General Mather, commander of the U.S. Army Third Corps, is on the reviewing stand. Afterward, the general will leave for a new assignment in Washington. Farewell ceremonies for General Mather get the day off to a colorful start. beginning for a busy schedule of events. Men of the 1st and 2nd Armored Divisions assemble in a nearby field and prepare to move their equipment past the reviewing stand. Both divisions were organized on the same day in 1940. During World War II, the 1st Armored Division went into combat in North Africa where it waged successful battle against the might of Nazi General Rommel's Africa Corps. In 1943, the 1st Armored went ashore in Italy and fought its way northward to the Alps, contributing to the final Allied victory over Nazi forces in Italy. Named Old Ironsides, the 1st Armored returned to combat in the Korean War. The 2nd Armored Division, known affectionately as Hell on Wheels, also fought in North Africa, took part in the invasion of Fortress Europe, moved swiftly across France, Belgium, and Germany, and was the first American combat unit to roll into Berlin in 1945. Since the Korean War, both divisions have had training and combat assignments and have sent units to various parts of the world in response to emergency orders from the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. The anniversary review brings together the most advanced military equipment and weapons with the best trained armored soldiers in the world. The main objective of the Armored Division is to employ its mobility and firepower against the enemy. A highlight of the Armored Birthday Party is a firepower demonstration. Relaxing the demonstration, General Mather sets off an Honest John rocket. The morning's formal event's over, visitors get a chance to see the countryside from the soldiers' point of view. Divisional vehicles are pressed into service to show the rock and roll type ride that soldiers must get used to. are offered to guests of all ages, 
as the festivities move toward the fairgrounds for an afternoon of fun and games. A scissors bridge, courtesy of U.S. Army engineers, decorates the entrance to the Midway. Ever felt like pelting someone with a pie, like in the old comedies? Well, this Midway attraction uses globs of shaving cream to do the same job. What's a carnival without pitching pennies? Here's a game that's sure to be popular with a great many soldiers. It's called Dunk the Sergeants. An opportunity like this comes once in a lifetime. This nice little lady is no major leaguer, but she has a go at it. Ball one. And a hit. The prize goes to the little boy who brought her along. With many of the visitors under 30, a beat band is right in the groove. All of the booths, games, refreshment stands, and rides were built and operated by organizations of the two divisions. One of the more popular offerings of the afternoon is a ride on this bucking bronco. This time, the horse has the last laugh. Final event in the anniversary celebration, is a nighttime review of regimental colors, a stirring presentation of the unit standards in the 1st and 2nd Armored Divisions. Some of these battalions date back to the Revolutionary War period, and all have gallant combat records. traditional remembrance of comrades in arms. commemoration ends with a brilliant display in the skies over Fort Hood. Each year, the Association of the United States Army, or AUSA, meets to bring its members up to date on latest military equipment and technology. Members also hear addresses by the nation's highest army leaders on U.S. military policies and posture. At Washington, D.C., the annual AUSA meeting 
features many interesting exhibits and distinguished guests. Outside the Sheraton Park Hotel, where the sessions of the AUSA Convention are to take place, are many interesting exhibits of military equipment and weapons. Among the items on display is a missile launcher carrier and an amphibious lighter for moving troops ashore from ships at anchorage. A special forces soldier explains the operation of hand weapons to visitors. In the hotel lobby, a large variety of army exhibits is on view to bring members of the association up to date. Taking a look at some of the tactical weapons and equipment used by U.S. soldiers is Secretary of the Army, Stanley R. Reeser, one of the distinguished guests at the three-day convention. This 20-millimeter gun, the Vulcan, being inspected by ROTC students, is being developed primarily as a defense against low-flying aircraft. The Army exhibit shows latest military communications capabilities. Sighting devices for firing weapons in night combat are displayed. Army Chief of Staff General William C. Westmoreland familiarizes himself with some of the newest equipment. A lesser known Army activity is the work of the combat artist. These pictures were made by professional military artists who carried a gun as well as a paintbrush into the zone of battle. A major purpose of the AUSA convention is an exchange of ideas and experiences. A meeting of sergeants major features reports on matters concerning the enlisted man. One of the scheduled speakers is sergeant major of the Army, George W. Dunaway, assigned to the office of the Army Chief of Staff as representative of enlisted personnel. The convention program features many colorful receptions and ceremonies held in various parts of the hotel. Providing a musical background for presentation of the colors is the United States Army Band. President of the Association, Frank Pace, Jr., introduces the keynote speaker, Army Secretary Reeser. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to address the annual meeting of the Association. These meetings continue, I believe, to be a most effective way of informing our members and the American public of the Army's accomplishments and of its goals for the future. The past year has seen the gradual but steady improvement of the South Vietnamese Armed Forces. The performance of the South Vietnamese Forces during Tet 
gave them renewed confidence in their fighting ability and with it a much needed boost in their morale. Subsequently, the South Vietnamese government has taken steps to significantly increase the size of their forces. Of greater significance is the overall improved level of performance. The Vietnamese regular, regional, and popular forces and civilian irregular defense group units are now a better trained and better equipped units, and their combat effectiveness has improved markedly. The outstanding example, I believe, is South Vietnamese Army's 1st Division, which has assumed responsibility for manning portions of the eastern sector of the demilitarized zone and has inflicted 10 times the casualties on enemy forces that it has incurred itself. At the same time as the South Vietnamese have enlarged their contribution to our military operations in Vietnam, the effectiveness of the United States military forces has steadily improved as a result of various efforts originated by General Westmoreland and continued by General Abrams. While until recently there was relatively little change in the total strength of the enemy forces operating in South Vietnam, the Viet Cong has for some time experienced difficulty in recruiting, and their numbers have decreased significantly since June of 1967. As a result, the enemy has fewer men familiar with the local terrain and with guerrilla tactics. In addition, the larger percentage of North Vietnamese, in North Vietnamese increased the logistics burden of the enemy who are less able to rely on local sources of supply. The combined effect of the South Vietnamese modernization program, the gradual improvement of their combat units, the increasingly effective performance of our forces, and the decline in the numbers of the Viet Cong is to create a situation which from the point of view of the military in which, from the point of view of the military position, I believe time is clearly on our side. An important status report from abroad by the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, General Lyman L. Lemnitzer. First, let me say a few words about the threat in Europe. That is, the, the capabilities of the potential enemy. I must emphasize here that I am speaking of military capabilities which are known to exist. I am not speaking about enemy intentions for planning can be based on intentions only when one knows what they are. But I have found no one willing to come forward with such information. That is, no one willing to take the risk of making an error in guessing these intentions. No one willing to assume the responsibility for the consequence of their error. Intentions can and do change overnight whereas it takes years to develop and refine military capabilities. We really do not know what the Soviet leaders have in mind. I am not certain that even the Soviets know themselves what they intend to do either, either in the near or distant future. But we do know that they are capable, what they are capable of doing. Sound military planning should only be based upon on what the potential enemy can do, not on what one guesses he is likely to do. And what better way to confirm what he can do than by looking at what he actually did? Our previous analyses of the Warsaw Pact powers has been <coughs> indicate that they were well-trained and well-equipped and that they were in a high state of readiness. And this was fully confirmed by their occupation of Czechoslovakia. In my talks before both civilian and military audiences over the past few years, I have continually pointed up the capability inherent in the frequent and massive maneuvers of the Soviet and other Warsaw Pact forces in Eastern Europe. That is, their ability to strike 
at the heart of Europe with little or no warning. Well, their strike at their own ally came after extens a, an extensive series of command post communications and logistical exercises. It also came without any tactical warning whatsoever. The serious implications of this lesson should not be lost on any of us. One last point on the threat. The capabilities that exist are quite clear. But what is equally as clear is that the will of the Soviet Union to use her military power to achieve her aims. To use it, this military power, without regard to world opinion, without even regard to the reactions of the communist world. To many observers, the invasion of Czechoslovakia was unthinkable. To many well-intentioned seekers of peace, the Soviet Union had rejected the, the overtures of power. Unfortunately, what was unthinkable and what appeared to be rejected was not. The Soviets showed their will to use the power they have whenever their vital interests are involved. World opinion to the contrary notwithstanding. Army Chief of Staff General Westmoreland addresses the convention. I am grateful for this opportunity to address the delegates at this annual meeting of the Association of the United States Army. Until now, my work with the Association has been at the local level. As a commander, I have observed and profited from the fine work of the Association. I know firsthand the tireless efforts of the AUSA members. Our membership is varied. It includes many military members, both active and retired, and a great number of civilians, many who are veterans of the military services. Although membership is varied, all of our members are dedicated to the principle of a strong army as a vital element of the military security of this nation. As a commander, I found the AUS AUSA provided me with a broadened perspective. It served as a val valuable bridge that joined the military and civilian communities. This is why it is a great privilege for me to address our national convention. Today, I want to talk about professionalism because professionalism, in my mind, is the payoff. To me, a professional is an expert in his field who is dedicated to his mission and is proud of his ethics and standards. He is a dynamic, growing being who learns from the past, acts in the present, and prepares for the future. Above all, he focuses on accomplishing his mission. The ultimate test of any professional is, of course, what he accomplishes, how he fights the battle and the results he achieves. In this res respect, today our fighting men are performing in Vietnam as professionals. I want to summarize quickly the accomplishments of these troops. But to be meaningful, these accomplishments must be viewed in the light of the mission. Simply stated, there have been four points to our mission. First, to prevent the enemy from imposing by force a communist government on South Vietnam. Second, to protect the people and resources of South Vietnam from communist control or domination. Third, to defeat attempts by the enemy to seize territory of strategic importance or terrain of tactical value in South Vietnam. And finally, and fourth, to weaken the enemy by applying maximum pressure on his ranks and means of support. Keeping in mind the overall mission, that of helping the South Vietnamese defend themselves against aggression, consider these accomplishments in judging with me the professionalism of our fighting men in Vietnam. 
They have adapted quickly to a strange environment and demonstrated that they are physically and mentally tough. They have beaten the gorilla at his own game by operating like the gorilla day and night. They have defeated every main force that they have met, driving the remnants back into sanctuaries or hiding. They have consistently frustrated the enemy and denied him any significant military objectives. They have prevented the communists from overrunning South Vietnam or any part of it. They have set the example and helped train the South Vietnamese Army, an army that grows and improves every day as it proudly assumes an increasingly greater share of the battle against the communist aggressors. They, our troops, have helped to provide the climate of order for the creation of a constitutional democracy. They have earned the respect of the South Vietnamese people by their courage, deeds, and humanitarian acts. Finally, helped develop a well-balanced, highly effective military force with great firepower and mobility, a force that continues under the superb leadership of General Abrams to serve notice on the enemy that any further military action on their part will continue to be extremely costly. In my judgment, the enemy now finds himself in a position where he cannot achieve military victory in South Vietnam. Thank you, General Westmoreland. At a memorial dinner, the George Catlett Marshall Medal, in honor of the distinguished World War II commander, is presented to Maxwell D. Taylor, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all. The meeting of the Association of the United States Army adjourns until next year, when new Army ideas and concepts will be introduced to the membership. Today, on your Army reports, you have seen two events which perpetuate the traditions and achievements of the United States Army. Events like these, which commemorate the past and show renewed faith in the future, contribute greatly to the morale of the United States soldier and to the development of ever-increasing ties between the people of this country and those responsible for its defenses.